Hey, I'm the Catalan Gamer, and this is a Pro Cycling Manager 2019 tutorial on career mode. And we're going to focus in primarily on getting things started uh, from the very, very first season and just season by season, what you do in the early portion of the season. Now, this tutorial is directed definitely at beginners. But if you are a seasoned player, there could be some definite things. I'm going to have a more advanced tutorial for, for veterans later on. But this will be for your beginner to intermediate uh, player of Pro Cycling Manager 2019. And again, we are focusing in on the career mode for this one. I will also have a Pro Cyclist mode tutorial coming out in the near future. At this point, I also have a couple other PCM19 tutorials. I do have a Pro Cyclist Mode tutorial from 2018. Uh, in the meantime, if you don't want to wait to see what happens with that. Uh, but currently, PCM19, I have two tutorials out. One on the attri uh, attributes, so rider attributes, breaking down each rider one by one as we glance at like Peter Sagan. So his average of a 79 and then breaking down flat mountain hills to uh, time trial and so on. And then I also have one on race basics. So how to run a race with your team. Now, in the team selection screen, you're going to have some options. And th this one goes, uh, again, primarily for beginners, but we're, we're going to get into enough detail for the intermediate group here as well. So star rating is going to be a good indication if you're not familiar with the teams themselves. If you're a casual uh, cycling fan and kind of picked this game up by chance and not necessarily a diehard fan, or maybe you are just like I used to be uh, when I was younger, just a Tour de France fan. You don't know any other cycling at any other point in the year. And even then, you only happen to catch a handful of stages of the Tour. And in the end, you know a few names. You know who Peter Sagan is. You know who Alaphilippe is. You know who Chris Froome is. And then, you know, hey, maybe that's it. So choosing a team might not necessarily be an easy thing for you. Now, if you have a favorite team and that's who you want to play as, well, then that's an easy selection for you. But beyond that... How do you pick a team? Well, a lot of that's going to depend on what you want to get out of the game. The teams differ from each other a lot more than you might think. Now, star rating, like I said, is an obvious way. If you don't trust yourself and you're just starting the game and you want a chance to succeed, well, Dukenink Quick Step is an obvious good choice as they're a four and a half star team and they have absolutely been tearing up the World Tour the last couple of years with win after win after win after win. This is a group capable up and down their roster of picking off stage wins and picking off single race classic wins. You can see that they have an extremely high sprint rating, cobble rating, which is good for classics, hills rating, which is good for getting those one-off breakaway victories. Their GC, their stage racing capability, it's good. It's not quite as good as well time trialing. So you're not necessarily going to get the best out of those two areas. But you could see they are maxed out in a lot of ways. Another really good choice, of course, is Team Ineos. Team Ineos is that opposite. You could see what you're lacking with Dukenink is the GC and time trial. And they are the best in that department. So Chris Froome, of course, uh, multiple winner, Garrett Thomas winner last year, defending champion of the Tour de France. And the best support team out there in terms of protecting 
whoever that top writer is with Kwiatkowski and then Bernal, who's only 21 years old. And I think this rating is very low for where he actually is already at this point. I think he's as good, if not better, than Garrett Thomas, personally. Uh, Walt Poles, I mean, this is a team built for the big races like the Tour de France. A couple other good choices. Uh, movie star, always contenders. UAE have really built up a strong team the last couple years. Mitchelton Scott, I think their rating should be a little bit higher than it is. Uh, the Yates brothers are phenomenal. In fact, I just finished watching uh, stage today. If you're watching this the day that I've posted this, I'm filming this earlier in the day, immediately after the conclusion of a win by Simon Yates in that stage. But they don't have as much of a supporting cast. You can see it drops off a bit rating-wise. So they're not quite as deep. And, and that's certainly a factor. Uh, Sunweb, another good choice. And, you know, up and down the order. Uh, Jumbo Visma have had an excellent Tour de France this year. This is a team that normally would not be considered one of the better teams. And yet they've actually grown considerably. And you can see there's actually quite... Uh, a good future for Jumbo Visma if they can hang on to these riders as Wout van Aert. Uh, Dylan Grunewagen. Grunewagen is arguably the best sprinter in the world right now. He's just 25 years old. Wout van Aert just turned 24. Uh, so you've got a very young team here. Unfortunately for them, their, their leader, Steven Kruisweig, now into his 30s and hasn't really materialized into that guy, but up and down this roster outside of Roglic and Kruisweig uh, and Tony Martin, a very young group, so a lot of potential there. Uh, Bora Hansgera is an exciting one, but it's kind of a one-man show uh, for the most part. It's Peter Sagan, and I think in-game it's a lot more difficult for Sagan than it is in real life as he really effectively makes the best of his surroundings in real life and in game it's a little more difficult for that to happen. Anyway, these are all the World Tour teams. Now if you pick one of these teams you are immediately into the World Tour and if you're a casual fan and you right away want to get involved in the Tour de France and you want to get involved in that, then you're probably going to want to have a World Tour team and get right around those big names, get to know those big names, get to know the game. But myself and a lot of players are going to want the full experience. And the full experience, of course, means coming through the ranks because there are three tiers. You have the World Tour... And that, that's all the main teams. And then you have Continental Pro. And if we glance at Continental Pro quickly, there are going to be some team names that you could and should recognize. Okay, Samsic, they're at the Tour de France right now. Cofidis, uh, Direct Energy. Uh, some other names that are maybe recognizable. Uskare. Uh, Israel Cycling, Nova Nordisk, if you're an American viewer, uh, Rally, uh, Roompot are a pretty good team, Vital Concept, and then of course the, the, the big one of late, the last few years, uh, Wanty Group Gobert. They find themselves in the World Tours and often doing a decent job of making a name for themselves. There, there's quite a few names in this group that are, are really quality riders, all things considered. Uh, Johan Alfredo is constantly in the breakaway. Uh, Thomas Gand is up there. Uh, Bognese makes a name for himself, especially on the continental level. Uh, Christian Eiking is in and around breaks often. Pascalon, th this is a team that constantly gets into the break, gets out there, gets noticed. And then all the while, you get late into a stage and the contenders are all challenging and the guy hanging on to the group, not always all the way to the end, but till pretty late, uh, Guillermo Martin. 
uh, Martin Goodright is. So Wanty Group Gobert is definitely a very competitive continental pro team. Now, these teams race at a lower level, but they often get invited to the big races, and, and that uh, really plays into what becomes available to you as a continental pro team. If you pick one of those bigger named teams, you could still end up getting an invite to the Tour de France, to the Vuelta a España or Giro d'Italia, the, the big Grand Tour races. And at the same time, play that bigger experience. But again, that's only one step below. If you really want the full experience, you got to start with a continental team. Now, these teams are going to have a bunch of riders that you don't know. There, there are star ratings, so you could start with Adria Mobile and start with a better team that's going to be competitive, that's going to do really well. Uh, Evo Pro Racing, I've got my Pro Cyclist mode, and I've got a rider uh, on that team. And, you know, there's a clear difference from half-star teams that really struggle where their best rider is a 65. They're all young guys, and you get down into mid-50s. This is a difficult team to take on and try to build. They've got no quality, they're really struggling, there's only 14 riders on the team, and they're going to have a really small budget. But here's my thought on that matter. If you're going to go all the way down to Continental, and you're going to you're going to run the gauntlet and you're going to try to work your way up the ranks because, yes, the Continental teams can become Continental Pro teams. The Pro teams can become World Tour teams. Okay, that is part of this game. That is part of real life on how that works. And we've seen it happen many, many times where teams work their way up. If you're going to do that, and you're going to come all the way down here to these teams that you don't know with these riders that you're not familiar with. One thing to consider is you might as well make a custom team yourself. Then it's your team. You've picked the name. You picked the jersey. You pick the riders. And you go from there. Well, we're going to quickly transition into how to pick the riders. Now, this same thing will go into the team that you pick. You can analyze the team by looking at the riders. If we go back for just a second, Continental, uh, if you look at the riders, on, on, just hover over the info, you're going to get an idea for the rider type. Now the way to do it, just organize it by rider type and see what type of riders you have. Keep an eye on that average though. That average certainly plays a factor into what you have. But for example, Adrian Mobile, their two best riders, by far, above everybody else, they're sprinters. Here's another way to get an idea for that without having to look down at the individual. This is a sprint team, first and foremost. So keep that in mind as you select a team, or if you go through custom and build a team, that's how you select your guys. Now, there's all sorts of ways to filter and search. But in real life, and ultimately in game, you're only going to have so many riders. You only have so much budget. And if you truly try to diversify what you have, you're going to have your hands full. Big time. Because one rider alone... <laughs> Peter Sagan excluded from this argument because he is absolutely the exception to the rule. If you have one quality rider alone with certain strengths, it's going to be really hard for that rider to be successful. This is a team sport. It really is. Whether you're playing pro cyclist mode or whether you're doing the career mode, it is a team sport. And one rider alone will struggle will absolutely struggle in here. They need a supporting cast. The reason why I said Team Ineos is so strong isn't that Chris Froome, by himself, is hands down the best writer ever. He's a really good writer. 
But what really helps him is that in a three-week Grand Tour race, he's got really good climbers surrounding him that are going to protect him and that are going to get him to a certain point where he can then take on the remnants by himself. But if he were all alone from the very beginning, the other teams would attack him and he'd be vulnerable and he would lose. So it takes a supporting cast. So in real life, and ultimately in this game, a team is going to have only two or three specialties, two or three areas of strength that they can do well at. And if you go really small, if you started with that half-star or one-star Continental team, and I've done that, uh, you're, you're welcome to look back at my Pro Cycling Manager 2018 career mode, which is actually still ongoing, by the way. I'm 60-something episodes into that series, and it still has one new episode every week, surrounded by my 2019 series. With a new video every day, by the way. But that series, way back at the beginning, episode one, and that first season, I took riders with nothing but an average of 66 or below. That's what I started with. I took on a heavy, heavy challenge, and it was certainly tough. But when you start small, the only way you're going to have any success is if you specialize. If you pick something that you want to focus on and then get riders of that capability. Now, the bigger the team, the more you can focus on, but you're still going to have a couple areas of strength. Team Ineos, climbing, time trial. That's their strength. Do can it quick step? They are punchy. And Classics Riders, that's their area of strength. Now, you'll have a few riders uh, as outliers that can do more than that, that are capable of more than that, and that helps. Every little bit counts as you grow and expand beyond that realm. But having a specialty makes all the difference. Sprint teams come and go. They change as their leader ages and... and and fades, you know, Mark Cavendish had teams built around him for years where he would have three, four support riders, his lead out guys. Quickstep was one of those teams recently, and then they've they've grown and adapted and they've added another specialty. But you ultimately need to pick something. So as a quick example, if we were to be a cobbled classic team. I would want to pick riders in that specialty. Now, if I immediately went out and took a Philippe Gilbert or a Wout Van Aert, uh, Oliver Nassen, and take the strongest cobbled guys, well, they have huge salaries, and I would instantly push myself out of Continental Division. And this is the thing you need to keep an eye on. And by the way, choosing your jersey and what nation you are ultimately sponsored from and this is a factor by the way you're going to want some writers that are within the nation so uh, let's just do a quick run down here uh, okay so if we you know if we were to take you know this french team and We'd want to make sure we're going to have some French writers on the team. Uh, otherwise, we're going to we're going to have some real problems with our sponsor, and we, we don't have too long to get into that, uh, as we need to pick these teams, but pick these writers. But if I were to add Philippe Gilbert, I have one writer on my roster. One cannot compete with one writer, but I'm already a Continental Pro team, just like that tells me that I have 16 minimum, I only have one. And we've already met most, uh, ate up a lot of our potential budget. So if you wanted a Continental team, you cannot take a Philippe Gilbert. Sorry, can't happen. You're going to have to start going down a bit lower, take other writers. Now, 
French team, French rider, just 24 years old, a 72. Well, maybe we could go for a Hofstetter. Right now, anyway, we're still Continental. So keep an eye on that as you select a team, as you pick riders. Focus on some sort of specialty. Don't take every rider from that specialty. But if you're wanting classics, well, pick some guys that are classics strong. Mark Hershey, really strong candidate, but he's he's a quality writer already. Let's maybe go a little bit further down. Let's maybe pick another uh, French writer or two. So keep an eye on the division. If you add a writer that puts you out of the division you want to be in, subtract them, keep searching, build a roster. You ultimately start with a really large budget. Your options are pretty limitless when selecting a team. But the only way that that's really going to be effective is if you don't overload too much. Don't make yourself too strong. Otherwise, you might not have a lot of fun. Unless your only objective is to like win everything. <laughs> Uh, in, in which case, maybe, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you do instantly go out and you pick all the best riders and instantly go into the world tour with Sagan and Froome and Alaphilippe and uh, Quintana, you know, all on your team. Okay. It, build a super team if that's what you want. So anyway, focus on a specialty or two. Get a few riders beyond that. You're, you're going to need kind of a wealth of, of support and always make sure you have at least a couple sprinters whether it's going to be your specialty or not it's just so you have something to compete with all right well I, i'm going to just randomly pick a team here and uh how about these guys all right we're going to get into it now this is a team with a time a trial specialist they, they are what they are I'm not going to worry about any of that until we get into it, but it, it will take a moment to load here. So once you get into it, it's going to start you on January 1st, and you're, you're going to have some instant tasks to get into to complete. You, you're going to get a little bit of an introduction to things, so this will help make sure you read through this. Not every message matters on reading every detail, but at least on your January 1st, Go ahead and read those messages. They'll give you clues, especially if you're not sure what to do. But prom promotion relegation system has changed. There's a team index. That team index is found here under rankings, but it is not available until August 1st. The reason for that is the signing period begins August 1st. It's going to lay all the teams out based on the quality of of the team. So look at the squad. Here's my quality of the team. I have Martin Madsen. Madsen is a 73 average. He's the highest rated guy on the team. Most of our rating is going to be based off of him. Now he's got a contract that runs through 2020, which means he'll be here this season and he'll be here next season, which means he is already contracted for next season, which means he is considered onto the roster. These guys, these five, are not considered part of our roster for next year. So our evaluation on that team index is going to be based off of all of these riders who are still going to be on the team. And then as you sign up new riders or re-sign riders, it's going to add to your evaluation. But again, as our best rider by far, Madsen is going to kind of hold the torch for how our team looks. Basically, it's what's your potential? What's the quality within your team? That'll determine who the best 18 teams are that are going to stay as World Tour. What that next best 20, uh, what is it, 20 something, 24 teams for Continental Pro. And then everybody else is Continental. If you start low, if you start small, it could take two or three seasons before you're going to build up enough. And it depends on your budget. And then that budget, well, that all comes down to the sponsor confidence. It's going to be a really big thing you got to go for. And that's 
the danger zone also about totally specializing in one area or another. You can dominate and you can become successful and you can grow a team that way, but you're not always going to meet your sponsor objectives if your team is only capable of a sprint and then your sponsor suddenly wants you to do well at a mountain race. Uh, that creates an issue. But again, if you diversify too much, especially with a small team, well, you're not going to win the mountains and you're not going to win the sprints. You're going to struggle through both because you don't have the support riders because you have one guy who can climb and nobody else can. And so the one guy who can climb halfway through a climbing stage is all alone against the field. And the field, they have teammates, and so they're fresh, and he's tired, and then they ride away, and you're left in the dust, and that one guy finishes in 50th. The rest of your team's, like, outside of the top 100, but he got 50th. Well, you didn't meet your sponsor objective there either, or maybe he hangs on a bit longer and he gets, like, 20th. You're still not meeting your sponsor objective in that case, so be careful if you diversify too much. Know your team Know what you're good at. Focus on that. Promotion relegation. Give them a couple support riders that next season. Get a couple guys that are decent at climbing. Maybe they're not good at other things. Maybe they're a cheaper rider. But at least you've got a couple riders that can climb that you could put into a race with them that can get them a bit further. That rider makes it through to that halfway point or further three quarters of the way into the stage before they get dropped. Finally, that decent climber, they're going to get a little bit further and maybe they can start getting top 10s instead of top 25s. Okay, preseason, this is a big one. Uh, your preseason page, we're going to get into that. And I've learned a lot on this one myself because the system's a little bit different than how it used to be. And there, there's some clear things to do now but also the preparation of the calendar Let, let's start with that so your calendar okay first lesson unless you have a huge team unless you have a world tour team you probably have a limited number of writers in our case i think we have about 14 Any given race is going to require between six and eight riders. Usually for Continental, we're, we're looking at about seven riders for every race. Yeah, 14. At best, I can field, well, two teams of seven. So when you look through your calendar and you add or subtract races, when you're adding races, you can see here it says not invited. If you're trying to add a race, you're not necessarily going to get into that race. And you don't necessarily just want to add every single race out there either. You have to manage your team and you have to manage fatigue. And, and that's all a factor. So you don't want to overload your team too much. But the first and obvious lesson here is don't take on more races then you can field teams for. If you can, if, if you have eight, nine riders on your team, and, and that could happen, then you're a one race at a time kind of team. Don't overload your calendar. If you get to that point where you've got 13, 14, 15 riders, then you can handle two at a time. Don't schedule three. That's the biggest lesson on the calendar. But that next lesson, find your specialty. Outside of your sponsor objectives, which are the starred races, and there's nothing you can do about those. You can't subtract those. Outside of the sponsor objectives, Try to get into some of those races that are your specialty. Now, I don't even know. I, I have not looked at the, the team here on what we are specialized in. But if I'm just looking at the Herald Sun Tour here, 
looked at the profiles. First stage is a short prologue. We've got a hill stage on two and five. We have a sprint stage on three and four. If I'm a climbing specialty team, I'm not going to want to participate in the Herald Sun Tour. We're not going to do well. If I'm a cobbled classics kind of team, same thing. If I'm a sprint team, well, looking at the profile, five stages, two of them are going to end up in a sprint. As in stage three and four, they're flat. That's sprint territory. Okay. It's not the best profile, but 40% of the stages are going to give us an opportunity to do what we do. Maybe. Maybe that's a good place to go. Well, at the same time, hold on. Let's look. The Vuelta a San Juan International. It's going on at the same time. Now, I only have one race right now, but, well, let's look at that one. That's a sprint. That's not. That's a punchy hill climb at the end. But that's a sprint. And that's a punchy... That's a climb climb at the end. So, 50% of those stages, well, they're sprint. Now, if I only have one or two sprinters and I take on another race at the same time that's also going to use those sprinters, well, you, you see where I'm going with this, hopefully. Don't overstretch. Because again, the more races your riders participate in, the busier their calendar, the more fatigue they're gonna suffer. So pick your calendar carefully. Now, if you're brand new to the game, let it be. Don't mess with the calendar. Mess with it as you figure it out, as you know more and more. You have periods. It's broken up January to March, April to May, June and July, August till the end of the year, October. You can alter your calendar until just before the start of each of those periods. Meaning you can make changes later. So if you're not sure what you're doing and you're just getting started, don't change your calendar the first three months. Take it as it is. Deal with it. The only thing I suggest is if you find you're scheduled for three and you can't handle three races, look at just those two that are during that period. Compare them. The whole race, not one day of it, not one stage, Let's like let's look at this here. Where is this Tour of Columbia? Fourteen April. Ah, here we go. Okay. Well, they're both objectives. Okay, I wouldn't be able to get rid of them. But look at between the two. Right, Tour of Columbia, three sprint stages, two hill stages, mountain climbing stage. The second one, two hill stages, one sprint, and a basic prologue. It's 10K. It's in between. But I would definitely want my sprinters at Tour Columbia. A lot more opportunities there. I'd want my climbers at Columbia. And maybe a couple punchy hill guys at Provence. And especially if I have a good time trialist, prologuer, I would definitely take them to the second one. But look at those. Look at your team profile. See what which one suits. If you can't handle two races, try to delete some races. Get yourself down to where you only have one race at a time. Focus on that. But build your calendar first and foremost. All still on January one. You're not going to continue. You're not going to move forward a day until you've done quite a bit of work. That's January one's that difficult one. You've got to get through. Okay, staff is a thing, depending on how small or big your team is, you're going to want to add coaches. You might want to add a second scout. I wouldn't have more than a couple unless you're on a massive team. And if you're a team that's going to regularly run two races and you have the budget to spare, only if you have it to spare, 
a second doctor is also useful. The next big thing is seeing where your objectives lie. This matters a lot more in 2019, but it's a bit more of an advanced mechanic, and I'm going to save that one for the advanced tutorial. From there, though, preseason and planner. You need to spend some time with these before you move on. Now, here's the biggest, best lesson that I have learned. Don't bother switching them out. Put them all on very high. If you learn and understand the mechanics in the game, very high matters a lot more. Confirm that, put them all on very high. I don't care what rider it is, I don't care when their first race is, put them all on very high. And confirm that. That's one of your January 1 tasks. You can't continue until you've taken care of your preseason. We'll, we'll glance at that one. There you go. Preseason. So this one, until you've confirmed it, it won't let you go forward. Now, the reason for this is that the way the mechanics work, you can and should maintain a high fitness level and that's what this number is is your fitness level for every rider throughout now this we can't do until january 2nd because it was based on the selections we made here on january 1st so we're going to go ahead and move forward one day so we can get to january 2nd and then we'll get into that next piece here Uh, equipment, I've talked about equipment in my race basics tutorial, uh, so if you want to know about equipment, check that one out. But now, preseason, done. These guys are all s selected. From here, we're going to spend some time in the planner. Now, if you were making changes to your calendar and you were re requesting invites to races, it, it kind of throws a wrench in things because some of those answers are going to come back immediately the next day. If you're a Continental Pro team and you're asking to get into World Tour races, you're not going to find out right away. It complicates things. And so you're going to have to do this more over a period of time. Now, it's possible to plan your entire season by January 2nd in this game. The entire season. But things happen. And it's going to require you to go back in and tweak it from time to time. Or you can plan out a month at a time. But whatever you do, don't wait till the last minute. As in, like, race day comes up and you hadn't selected a team, you hadn't prepared your riders. That's a quick way to struggle in this game. So you do need to do preparation ahead of time. But you don't have to prepare the whole season ahead of time. If, you're, if you don't have patience for that, you want to get to racing, you could get to racing. But at least plan out through, you know, like February at the start so you're prepared. Because there's a couple of tasks that you're going to have to do. First, before you get into fitness, which here's the pull down for that. And oh my gosh, it took me forever to find this myself. And I was really mad that this wasn't in the game. It was, I just didn't know where it was. This is really important, but we're going to come back to it. First, you need to build your writer's schedule for at least that period. We're going to go through, uh, well, I won't go all the way through February. I'm, I'm going to just do the first few races just to give you the pro tips here and, and get you started. But stars, that's objective. That's really important. Focus on your objectives first. Make the sponsor happy. Okay, uh, Everything going forward beyond the current season depends on sponsor confidence. Okay, uh, Long story short on this one, and I, I suppose we'll go take a look. There we go. 
Uh, this determines your sponsorship money. Right now, we have a budget of 83000 per month. It has the potential to more than double what it is currently, long term. That's good potential, and that's actually quite a bit of money for a Continental team starting out. It's on the higher end. I've started with much, 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 much less than that. You get an evaluation. Now your evaluation is based on a lot of things. Your results, the, the riders that register for specific races, and an evaluation of the squad itself. Going by date, these are sponsor objectives. These are what they want us to complete. They want me to get a stage win at the San Juan International, top 10 at the Grand, Grand Prix Cyclista Le Mars, Marseille. Top 10, top 10, top 10, top 10. I like that actually, that's pretty straightforward. Stage win and top 10s. Focus on these objectives because they're gonna have the biggest impact on your evaluation. The results included are noteworthy results, which can come from these or can come from other races. So you get a bonus. You go off, it's not an objective, but you go to a race and you win that race. Well, depending on the race, if it's a big race and you win it and you're a small team, wow, they're gonna look at that and go, that was a great win. That'll show up on your noteworthy results. It's going to have a plus. The more pluses, bigger the impact. Registered riders, same thing. You've got your top guy on your team. He can't race every race. He can't go to every single race on your calendar. He's got to rest. So you take the biggest name on your team, and you don't take him to the Tour de France because you want to rest him and send him to other races. Well, you're not going to get a bonus for that. The team's not going to be very happy that you didn't send them to the biggest profile race of the season. But you do take them to a certain race that shows up on the calendar that they care about. And they're going to be really happy you brought the highest profile, biggest name there, and it could stand out. That one, that one's kind of iffy on how that works. But the team looks for certain things. This was one of the big ones that I was talking about. If you take a French team, right, when we were talking about custom nation or custom team, if you take a French team and you have no French riders, well, they're not going to be happy. They want to be represented. If you have an American team and you have, like, two American riders on the entire team, they're going to be like, yeah... You do know that you're an American team, right? Right. Also, they care about the popularity of those writers. And then overall. You might be a small team. You, you might be, let's say, a team from Mexico. You might be from Mexico, and you might not have a big contingency of Mexican writers on your team, but you picked up Romain Bardet. That's a big name. That's a big name in the sport. They're going to be pretty happy with you that you managed to get him onto your team. So, squad eval. All right, well, anyway, those things all combine, and your results throughout the year, they all combine to an evaluation. It's going to go up or down. The biggest thing that's going to impact this confidence going up or down are those objectives. Did you get a stage win? at the, the Tour de Lien. Especially when that's a full four-star objective for them. You didn't get a stage win? Well, boo-hoo. Down goes your success level. Your evaluation within these color schemes, super success, success, acceptable, will impact your budget for the next season. By the way, important note, this evaluation it's finalized July 31st. 
the day before you go into the signing season, the day before August 1st. So really, really important that you know and understand that this actually only runs through the end of July. After that, it doesn't matter what you do. Because those impact things so greatly on your budget and growth of your team, especially if you're planning on playing multiple seasons, take care of the objective races first. They matter more. More stars, more important. Small impact, big impact. All right. This tells you the number of riders that the team needs. So there's six spots, seven, seven, seven. Look at this one. We have a 17 kilometer tri time trial on stage five. We have three sprint stages, two full blown mountain stages and a hills stage. So I need my strongest mountain guys. I need a couple sprinters and I need somebody who can handle some time trials. I think the objective and know your objectives, by the way, what is it asking you to do? It said stage win. I don't necessarily need to take my best mountain climber, my best time trialist. I don't need to go for the overall. I need to get a stage win. If that was what the objective was, I think it said it was, but I'm not paying close attention to that right now here for the tutorial. It wants a stage win. That makes a big difference on what you bring to the table. If this needs a top 10, well, again, it changes the perspective. Here, I've got to win a stage. If you have another lengthy race like this one, three stages, all hill stages, I need somebody who's going to hang in in the group in the end and be there and contend. They don't necessarily need to win a stage. They just need to still be in that front little pack stage by stage so that they can have a high overall placing. Know the objective. Focus on the objective. Build a team based on that. Then diversify a little bit. So, for a stage like this, right? Is your best opportunity to win a stage going to be on the mountain climber if you're a small team? Probably not. There's probably better climbers out there. But could you potentially win a sprint? That might be a little bit easier to pull off. If done right, sprints could be relatively easy things to win in this game. Because you can, on a flat stage, you could pretty much get everybody to the end of that stage most of the time. If you do it right, if you have the right lead out and you have a decent sprinter, you can get them in the right position and give them a decent chance of getting a win. On a mountain stage, colors run true. If you're not a climber, you're not going to win. Period. Unless you get a breakaway that goes half an hour away and they decide not to chase. That's not happening. So, unless you have climbers on your team, you're not going to win that. Well, we only have a single quality rider on the team. What is his strength? Time trial. Okay. Well... Let's look back at the profile. What do we see? Stage 5. 17k time trial, which is a mix between prologue and time trial. He's got a 76 rating for time trial and 76 rating for prologue. Guess who's going to give us our best shot of winning a stage? He's going to that race regardless of what else he can do. Because probably stage 5... Right? We're going to pencil that in as our best chance for a win. Beyond that, though, three chances to win a sprint. I'm not strong in the sprint, as there's literally nobody else on the team that's strong at anything. But maybe a sprinter. Let's bring a sprinter to the race. He's not going to be good at anything. That punch isn't going to matter on those mountains. This guy can sprint, though, so we'll bring him. There's another sprinter. Now, if I have three sprinters at the race, 
what do I have? I've got a, a rider for the actual sprint, and I have two riders to lead them out, which means they can get him in the right position and give them that best chance to do something. <clears throat> That's how you build your calendar. I'm not going to finish this off. You get the idea. When you start having these overlapping races, they can't be in both races at the same time. So you've got to build carefully. That's why I said don't overload the calendar, because with two races at the same time, that final day of it, you need two full teams. You're going to have to send guys somewhere else. And <laughs> that's an objective, too. It starts getting tricky quick. But let's go ahead and look at Madsen for a second here. Uh, let's let's just say he's going to be in this race, uh, and he'll be in that race, and that race, and we'll put him in this race. Okay, there's his early calendar. Now, that was just random. I know. Don't build it random. Build it, I was saying, build based on need, objective first, but you've got to rest riders. They can't do every race. Okay. Now we're going to open the management. Remember how I said pick very high for everything? The way fitness works in this game, this is the fitness bar, okay? You want this as high as you can get it all the time. What you don't want is this red bar to show its ugly face at any time. So looking at this calendar that we've built, for Madsen, he's in trouble by the end of February. We've got to make this red bar go away, but we've got to keep this green bar full as much as we can. Here's how you do it. On or off is just about all you need. It'll cover you for 99%. On is triple plus as in very hard training you have four options here you have take a break for your training schedule pro cyclist mode lays this out a little bit easier it's a little cleaner career mode's got everybody so it's a little more streamlined you have light training you have normal training or you have heavy training to me heavy training is triple plus and that's on Break is zero, and that's off. That's all you need. Train heavily or don't train at all. You don't need the plus one or plus two, except for in rare circumstances. We won't get into that too much. But we're going to turn them on. Now, you can see that turning them on, well, here, let's, let's, let's just do triple plus all the way, and you'll see. He's tired. He is very tired. His fitness, very high. There's 100% right there by the beginning of February. But his fatigue is going to just skyrocket and get ridiculously high, which is going to ruin his race day condition, and that's bad. Here's how this works. If he had nothing on his calendar, if he had no races whatsoever, if you take a break once every five weeks, he will not be fatigued. Train hard for four, break for one. Train hard for four, break for one. Train hard for four, break for one. They will not be fatigued. However, they race, and that affects their fatigue. So you have to micromanage this a little bit. And that's why I say calendars change. Riders get ill. Riders get injured. You get late invites to races like... Uh, world Tour races, if you're a Pro Continental and you're you're asking for that invite, it comes months later and you get accepted, or you don't, and it alters your calendar. It can be tricky to plan the entire season at once. If you're Continental, you're not going to any World Tour races. You could technically do your entire calendar until that injury comes along and that rider is now out, not training at all, not participating at all, and somebody else has to take their spot. And now you're messing up that person's calendar. So in a perfect world, with no injuries and everything, you can plan your entire season. And then just tweak things as you go along through the season as you need. 
Now you can see that his 100% fitness level is actually starting to fade here because of how bad the fatigue is. We need to fix that. I said on or off once every five weeks, right? Well, again, their calendar, his calendar here, messes that up. You can't just do four on, one off. But what you can watch is this red bar. Tweak it until it doesn't show up. And you've got to watch around here. First one I'll try, we'll go right here. We turn this week off, and look at that, just like that. He's got high fitness, maintained for a long period of time, and now no fatigue until we get all the way to here. Turn that off, and there you go. There's his first two months with a high level of fitness throughout, which is going to give him a bonus to how he races day in, day out. And he has no fatigue. Do that for every rider. Do it for every one of them. Build them up. And then give them a break when they need a break to keep them from having the red bar. Look at here. I could probably do the same thing here. Okay, you can see now for Christopher, right, who I have not built his calendar, by the way. Uh, you can see he's still getting fatigue. If I wait till here, give him the break, this week anyway, he will be tired. We don't necessarily want that unless he's not racing that week, and it, in which case it won't matter. Not a big deal. But we take this week off. And you can see he's good. As I add in races for him, maybe he's not going to be good. There you go. Added enough races. His break here, it's not 0%. Why? Because he's racing the Tour of Roads. So he's got a few days off that week, but he still has to race three days that week. Not a full break. Here's other issues because here was that other week that he was supposed to have off. He's racing four or five days that week. If we give him a break here, it's a little bit better. His fitness isn't going to be as good though because now he's got three breaks in a five week span because he's racing too much. That's why I said managing their calendar really does matter. The biggest thing though, is just do not let that red bar show up. Keep that red bar away and train hard as often as you can get away with without that red bar showing up. And there's your training managed. Do that throughout the year and you'll get the best out of your riders in the races themselves. Well, check out my race basics tutorial for that one. But there is how you set up your career mode, your team, choose your riders, know your squad. That's the biggest thing. Know your squad, know their strengths, know their specialties. Try to get into races that are good for those specialties. Focus on your objectives. And then focus on that planner and selecting the right riders for the race because if you're going to go to Tour Columbia and you want to finish in the top 10 the mountain climb is going to determine the standings for that stage guaranteed the hill climbs they'll affect it as well the flat not an issue if you have 150 riders in the race you're going to get 130 of them or more to the finish line in one big group all in the same time. Stage six, you might end up with two or three riders, five riders, ten riders, getting to the finish line together at the end. Take your best climber. Don't forget to take your best climber if you need to finish in the top ten. Even if they don't manage to finish in the top ten, if they finish in the top 25, it at least will only be a partial failure to that objective. So plan carefully, plan wisely, keep their fitness as high as you can. Keep their fatigue away and always plan around those objectives 
and plan ahead of time. Tweak things as you go along through the season, and you'll be just fine. I'm Decathlon Gamer. This has been the beginning of season career mode tutorial. Bye for now.